uh, I'm an engineer with GoDaddy. I'm here to talk about how we leverage Beam pipelines or how we leverage Beam to build uh, stateful streaming pipelines at GoDaddy. Uh, here's a rough outline of what we'll talk about today. Uh, I'll give a brief overview about what GoDaddy does, uh, a couple of use cases on why why we uh, why one would like to build a streaming data platform, uh, and then talk about a couple of architectural patterns which we evaluated before going with uh, a certain architecture pattern, and then go through what does our architecture look like and what are some of the abstractions that we have built, uh, and then also talk about what what does a typical pipeline deployment lifecycle look like for us using Flink, uh, and then hopefully we have enough time for a short demo where I can talk about and show you guys uh, some of the abstractions that we have built and also leave some time for the questions and answers. Uh, with that said, uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. So uh, as you guys might, might know, uh, GoDaddy is the place where one would, uh, where entrepreneurs come together, they start and grow their businesses online. They, if they want to run an online presence, GoDaddy would be the place to go. We are the world's largest uh, service platform for entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, we have over uh, 20 million uh, everyday entrepreneurs and it's in our DNA to make sure that our customers are successful businesses small businesses are successful so we we as a team strive to uh, essentially provide all the tools uh, that can help customers uh, to to essentially grow their presence online so, so a few of the products that we host if let's say you were to buy a domain on godaddy you could do that you could purchase ssl certificates you could host your entire website on godaddy and a ton of other products you could uh, also buy uh, on our platform uh, that's kind of like a brief a high level summary of what GoDaddy does. Now, one would ask what, what is the need for building a streaming data platform? For this, I figured we'll we'll talk about a couple of use cases that we had in mind uh, that 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 can help our customers essentially to be successful. So the, the first use case that I'm gonna talk about is <clears throat> uh, let's say you go to godaddy.com, you're in the process of starting a new business, uh, and the first thing you do is buy a domain online. Uh, uh, let's say you buy that domain. Now you have done that purchase online, but now you are curious to see what other GoDaddy offerings we have. And you figured it might be better to just call, talk to somebody live, talk to a customer care agent, uh, and ask them about what are some of the other offerings that GoDaddy provides. So in this case, uh, we have an amazing uh, customer care team. Uh, when, you, when you make that call to our call centers uh, to to learn more about the different products that we offer. Uh, historically, our, our pipelines were, were all batch and we would get the data uh, evaluated in a nightly fashion via batch jobs, which means that if you bought a domain just now and you call into customer care, they wouldn't really know uh, information about the domain that you just bought. They would have they would have to ask you questions later to what is that you're trying to do versus this information should have already been available for them. Now. One of the primary goals, and this is something that's running in production today, we have built our, our streaming data platform using Beam uh, uh, and have provided APIs for our care agents to integrate with so that they know uh, about a customer's journey right from the time when somebody has made a purchase and almost close to real time, get them that information. We like to call it like near real time or a low latency pipeline. Uh, and this is one of the use cases that are running in production and is it is as I said earlier, our DNA is to help our customers, and this is something that we believe we can better assist them so that our time is spent in answering questions that they have, not to repeat information that some that they would already know uh, if this system was available. Uh, the second use case, and this is something uh, a, a recent use case, and this is not yet running in production, but something we're trying to explore. Uh, companies run uh, A/B tests uh, all the time. Uh, now, with an A/B test, you Let's say in, in this specific example, uh, there are two variations of the website. One which has a search uh, domain button shown in a blue color. The other one is that same button shown in a black color. Now, uh, colors do play an important role in what users like. So let's say if you are running an A-B experiment to see which is the button that you're likely going to click if you were to add a domain to a cart and adding that domain to the cart becomes a success metric. Uh, now, uh, you would run uh, an A-B test uh, essentially where uh, you would have, or I guess in, in an A-B test, you would do this with uh, a limited period of a pure exploration where you're trying to allocate traffic 
uh, in kind of like equal numbers to the to the two versions in this case the blue version and the black version uh, and then once you declare a winner you move your uh, your your period of ex exploitation essentially now is done and 100% of the users go to the winning variation now one issue with this approach though is that you waste some resources i guess on the on the losing variation while trying to gather that information uh, we're trying to take an alternative approach to this which is using a multi arm bandit which is kind of uh, a more complex version of A-B uh, AB testing, which uses essentially machine learning algorithms to dynamic dynamically allocate traffic to the variations that are performing well, uh, while allocating less traffic to variations that are underperforming. Uh, we, we, we are using Epsilon Greedy to balance like the exploration versus the exploitation. Uh, and one of the things that we on the platform team are trying to do now is make this data, make the, the traffic data about our customers available to the machine learning team and the experimentation team uh, in a low latency fashion so that they can they can run these experiments at scale so uh, this is one of the uh, i guess we we have a ton of other use cases i could talk about but i figured these are the two ones that i find most interesting and this is something that we are currently in the process of building now uh, before we look at what godaddy's architecture is i uh, i wanted to talk about a couple of architectural patterns that folks might be familiar with uh, on the left uh, is the is the lambda architecture uh, where you, you essentially have two uh, two distributed systems that you're maintaining. One is a batch system, uh, and one is a is a real time or a, or a streaming system. Essentially, your in in the lambda architecture, your your incoming data is sent to both these layers, the batch layer and the real time layer. Once data gets into the batch layer, there's a batch engine. Uh, uh, traditionally or historically, companies have been using uh, uh, let's say Hadoop as a framework or any MapReduce framework to run their batch jobs. You have a finite set of data you can run your batch processing on, and it produces the snapshots. And then you have another layer called as a streaming layer, which is producing like the low latency results. And then you you kind of have a serving layer uh, that ties the two together, so that if you have an API at the end, uh, the the all the API is caring about, or I guess the serving layer's responsibility is to unify the batch and the streaming data. Now the architecture pattern on the right is called as the the CAP architecture. It's it's kind of a simplified simplified version of the of the Lambda architecture. In a, a CAP architecture, in my mind, is kind of like a, um, a a Lambda architecture system minus the batch processing system. Now, in order to replace that batch processing system, like data is simply fed uh, through the streaming systems quickly. Now everything is treated as a stream, uh, and operations are done on a subset of the. Uh, are, and I guess the the batch operations are a subset of streaming operations. So if you think about a stream, right, it's it's kind of an infinite stream, something that never ends. Now, if you were to add bounds to that stream, that essentially becomes a batch representation uh, of that data. Uh, so the good thing with 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 Beam is it's it's uh, it's it's a it's an abstraction language that lets that that's designed with keeping streaming use cases in mind as the as uh, with, with keeping like the stream use cases in mind, and then batch is just a special case of streaming, and that kind of naturally fits with what we had in mind when choosing uh, what kind of abstraction language to use. Uh, so th that's why we we went with the CAP archi architectural pattern, uh, and our pipelines are written in uh, in Beam, uh, and we run it on on different runners. We we run it on Flink on Amazon, uh, and then we also run the same set of pipelines on our on our legacy clusters or on our on our Hadoop clusters uh, using Spark as well. Now uh, let's look at what our architecture looks like essentially. So uh, the way we have divided uh, our uh, our platform architecture is divided into three different layers. The the first layer being uh, the ingress layer. So think of ingress as before anything can uh, enter the data platform, uh, we have a standardized standardized process that essentially takes care of consuming data from a wide variety of sources. So as an example, uh, our e-commerce platform. Uh, or our legacy e-commerce platform uh, writes the data to a SQL uh, to, uh, to a SQL server or to an MS SQL server. Now, uh, uh, MS SQL has this thing called as a CDC or a change data capture technology that can let you stream changes from uh, from what happened in your source tables. Now. Uh, uh, the purpose of our ingress layer is to now stream those changes uh, from from CDC and write that to Kinesis. Uh, Kinesis is, a, is, a, is an Amazon service. It's kind of like a stream uh, where you can write your data into. So that's one of the sources for for ingress for us. And then we also have our new e-commerce system provides the data uh, via APIs. So we we call those APIs and again write that data to Kinesis. We also have some other databases, including MySQL that we use. All of this bundled together is what becomes an ingress source for us 
uh, and and it, before anything can enter the data platform, it goes through this uh, ingress product. Now, the the second piece to our our platform is the uh, I guess is the the platform itself, and this is where we have been using Beam uh, as kind of like the uh, the abstraction language, if you will. Uh, and then we have added uh, our own SDKs on top of Beam, which is that. Uh, the the center portion which is the data platform with beam uh, and the pipeline abstractions one example of an abstraction is when you when you write data to kinesis uh, kinesis by default has a has a retention uh, of 24 hours uh, and and then i think you can the maximum retention you can get to is 7 days which means if you were to write your data to kinesis and on the 8th day you have you don't have the data for that one day because of the 7 day retention now uh, this is where kinesis firehose comes into picture in which you're writing to to Kinesis, and it also forwards those messages to to an S3 bucket as well. So then uh, S3 essentially becomes your your cold storage or or your persistent storage. Uh, now, when let's say you were to restart your pipelines from the very beginning, you wanted to replay events from the very beginning, which means you have some data in Kinesis, you also have some data in in S3, and there can be duplicates. One of the abstractions that we have provided is a way for uh, is a way to unify or remove the du du duplicates uh, in the data stream if you were to restart a pipeline from scratch. So that like, as a pipeline author, if you were to write uh, a pipeline from scratch, uh, you don't have to really worry about how do I consume data from Kinesis, then how do I consume the data from S3? How do I unify them together? How do I remove duplicates? So we provide a source uh, that abstracts that piece out. And we have a, a few other uh, similar abstractions that we have provided uh, in the platform. Uh, and uh, I, I'll, I'll I'll hopefully demo one one of the abstractions uh, later during the presentation. Now, once you once you have written your pipelines, you then have the ability to run the pipelines on on Flink on on AWS using a Kubernetes. Uh, you could run the same pipeline code using Spark, uh, and I guess th this was one of the primary reasons why we wanted to still have the ability to run our pipelines. Uh, on our existing clusters, and also while we migrate our infrastructure onto AWS, be able to run it on on the newer cloud platforms. Uh, and Beam naturally gave us that ability to write the pipelines once, having to maintain only one code base and the ability to run it on different runners, Spark and Flink in our case. And also with the direct runner, we can we get to run the same pipelines locally to speed up our testing process. Now uh, we. Uh, we use a ton of like Amazon services, including writing to RDS, including writing to SNS uh, topics. So our traffic feeds go, go into an SNS topic and then consumers subscribe to uh, those topics and, and that data gets into an SQS queue. Uh, we also write to Dynamo. Uh, and then we also have a local stack in our infrastructure piece, uh, which lets us spin up uh, Amazon services locally without having to deploy them on an actual Amazon uh, cloud instance. Uh, instead, we get to deploy these services on our on our local machines. Uh, and then on the on the right side, uh, I said we have three pieces. The right side uh, is, uh, I guess, before we talk about the right side, there's a third piece which is kind of missing in this picture. But that's the egress piece, and that's where once you run your Beam pipelines, once you run the processing, you write your data somewhere. Uh, in our case, we, we write to RDS using uh, JDBC IO. Uh, we, we again have an abstraction on top of it, and we also write to SNS, as I said earlier. Uh, and that is our egress piece. Uh, and then we have a query API that essentially consumes the data written to RDS and provides uh, an aggregated API to our end, con end customers who can who directly interact with the API. If you remember my uh, my slides from the beginning, we said our customer care team. Uh, gets that information about what a customer owns. So as an example, let's say they wanted to know what are all the domains somebody has purchased, how much have they spent with us uh, in totality. So you would call this query API and it would query that data, uh, which was written from this low latency pipeline into RDS and get them those, those results. Uh, we also then have some certain visualization tools, including Athena, Tableau, and Redshift to name a few, uh, that are essentially used to analyze the outputs produced by the Beam pipelines. One of the other outputs that our Beam pipelines essentially produce, uh, they produce something what is called as the as the clean layer, which gets used uh, in the data lake, which is a clean version of the pipeline. Uh, so let's say you have your input to the pipeline is a bunch of JSON fields, and then that clean layer is what become. I guess that's that's what we call, like to call as like the shareable data sets via the data lake to to other customers uh, on the platform. And then we obviously have a monitoring and, and an alerting on on the, on the entire system. Uh, that's kind of like a, a very high level overview of what our architecture does. Um, now, 
uh, I know I've been talking about like having like the abstraction in the pipeline and why that is important. So I'll talk about what is what does a life cycle look like for for somebody to write a pipeline on the data platform using Beam. Uh, so the first thing that you do is you you specify via a proto buff message uh, what is that you're trying to consume. Uh, as an example, let's say we we are we are making the customer data available to customers. Uh, sorry, we are making the customer data available to our platform users uh, via the Kinesis feed. You define a proto buff message to begin with and say, here are all the fields I'm interested in consuming from this feed. You define that proto buff message, that's step one. You write the transformations, uh, that's step two, in which you're saying, this is how, or I guess these are, these are the fields that I want to extract from this JSON payload. You specify those. You, you write your transformation logic, or in this case, the business logic, uh, and then you define your windowing and triggering strategy, uh, how often do you want to accumulate events, and so on and so forth, and then eventually write to a certain sync. Now, with the transformations, I took an example of just one stream. We we joined data from like more than uh, like five or six different streams together to, to eventually form an output. Uh, now, this is where things get interesting, and Beam naturally provides a way for us to write like these stream, streaming stateful pipelines leveraging Flink's Rocks DB uh, as the state backend. So an example uh, would be you have a customer feed where you have a list of customers. You have a billing feed which has a list of bills or the purchases that they made. And one of the things you're trying to do now is give me the aggregated total of a spend of a customer uh, on the platform. Or uh, uh, one of the other metrics that you, you might be interested in, how many how many domain searches are happening per second uh, on our pipelines? Uh, and all of those aggregations can be done with Beam. And the, the sweet thing about Beam is the, the, the way that's written, it's very intuitive to write like these, these uh, I guess the, the logic of combining or joining multiple streams together and deciding to know when to emit something downstream is something like a natural, kind of a natural fit with Beam. Uh, so now, uh, let's see. Okay, so th these are a few IOs that we currently use in production. Uh, and th the when we started with our journey of building stateful pipelines, I guess we started about like two and a half years ago, roughly. Uh, back then, SNS, SQS, Dynamo, DB IOs weren't available. Uh, we we developed those internally, and we worked with the uh, Beam community to uh, open source them. We contributed these IOs back. We also made certain enhancements to uh, HCAT IO and Kinesis IO, and then some of the other IOs that we use include Park A, Text File, and JDBC. Uh, so another nice thing about Beam or using Beam uh, is the, the ease of contribution back to the platform. The, in our experience, our platform team, when it when we contribute these IOs back, the the Beam community is pretty active, and and getting these IOs is something that's been very rewarding, and then getting to actually see and use it, and that's been fun as well. Now, uh, now now is the place where we'll actually get into some uh, actual core examples, and in in a bit also see what does a pipeline look like in our example. So let's say uh, the first thing you wanted to do was to specify a, a proto buff message about what does a customer look like. So you define the fees that you are interested in uh, in consuming from that customer feed. Uh, now that customer feed itself could have hundreds of uh, attributes about a customer, but let's say the pipeline that you are writing. Uh, you are only interested in consuming a few, a few fields. That's where you define what that what those fields are, so that we then get a P collection in in this specific example, a P collection of a platform customer uh, after reading the data from Kinesis in our example. Uh, and then you have uh, let's say an orders feed, which is getting information about what the orders look like. Uh, so you define that row of message. Then the third message, if you if your goal was to write an aggregation pipeline to figure out what is the total spend by a user. Uh, you would define a third a th third proto buff message that says this is my total customer spend aggregate. My my goal is to count the number of transactions that the user has done and the total amount. So you define a third uh, proto buff message. And I guess in terms of like from a from a pipeline author's perspective, these are the only three things that you would have to define in terms of uh, deciding what is that you want to consume, what does the shape of your aggregate look like, so that later down the line we can convert the platform customer to a customer spend aggregate and also the order to the, to the uh, same product of message, so then we can run a combiner, uh, a combiner or a combined function to, to unify, unify these uh, streams together. Uh, in this case, the key would be, let's say, the customer ID, uh, because our eventual goal is to write an output uh, that says how much has a customer spent and how much are the total number of transactions they have done. Um, 
uh, here's an, the, another example of what might a simple combiner look like. This is one of the uh, one of the very simplest examples of of a combiner. So so let's say you you implement the you implement beams combine uh, binary combined function, and you're saying uh, I have two aggregates uh, that I want to combine. And in my 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 example, we're trying to see how many number of domains uh, get searched uh, per second. So. So, so let's say you you have those two events. You you have a stream of these domain searches that are happening. Now you're trying to see per second how many searches happen. So, so you define this binary combined function where you're getting the searches per second and you are uh, essentially adding them uh, as they come in. And in the uh, I guess in the window above uh, in the stream aggregator class, uh, that's where we are defining. We are going to capture the events for let's say a second because we want to do it per second. Uh, and we know uh, there are. Uh, like every second we accumulate the events or the amount of searches that are happening on the platform, we do an aggregation uh, using the combiners and then we emit how many searches happened uh, during that one second. Uh, and this will start to make more sense once we actually look at the, the real code. I'll share my IntelliJ screen in just a few minutes. Now, uh, one other one other aspect of, uh, of running or building a streaming platform is in, in, a, in a traditional batch system, the idea of joins uh, is pretty intuitive where you, you have a finite set of data uh, let's say, in, in the, taking this example, you have three different tables uh, in, a, in a batch world. You have a customer table, a domain table, and a bills table. You know how to write or you know how to do those joins naturally because you have a finite data set and you can write a query that does the join. You could write a hype query that joins th these three different tables together. Now, if you translate this problem into a streaming world, uh, stream by definition is something that never ends. Now, how do you do a join? Uh, for something that doesn't end, that's where the the concept of windows and and triggers uh, and the use of, of beam it kind of fits it, it kind of acts as a natural model for somebody to understand. Okay, when I, I have a window, there's a finite start and an end on on which that window is based. If you had a fixed window of a minute, you know that you're going to collect those events for that one minute. In this case, you're going to collect the events from customer domains and bills feed for that minute. Write your logic to do the joins uh, for that minute. Uh, and and once that's done, your trigger is going to emit the output downstream, uh, and then uh, and then add similar logic. Uh, once if you if you get another update to a customer, another update to a domain, you if you have an upsert in the database, you can again update that event. And this kind of naturally fits in the Beam model and something that we have embraced a lot when when we have written these pipelines. Now uh, the. The other important thing for for us for using Beam was to essentially what we call, like to call it like future proofing your pipelines. Uh, since Beam is an abstraction language for writing uh, pipelines, our language of choice has been Java. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we run the same code on two different runners for today, at least Flink and Spark. Later down the line, if a third runner or if another runner comes in uh, into picture and we wanted to explore that, we can do that. We we right now are are doing our deployments on on AWS. We again. Uh, this ability to have your pipeline uh, written once and not married to an implementation. Let's say if we were to program directly against Flink APIs, we would be bound to use Flink without like, essentially doing a rewrite. So Beam gives us that flexibility to, to in the future, mm -hmm. potentially switch to a different runner supported by, by Beam itself. So I, I guess that's one of the really important things for us that we took into consideration when we went with, with Beam as a language of choice. Uh, now, uh, what are some of, I guess, what does the deployment life cycle look for for us uh, in terms of like these pipelines? So we 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 use Beam uh, as the SDK uh, and then have our own SDKs on top of it and we combine all of those pipelines into uh, an Uber jar. Uh, we are deploying our pipelines using Kubernetes. So we spin up a Flink cluster on on Kubernetes on and deploy those on Amazon. Uh, and then once those pipelines run. Uh, we essentially take this Uber jar and submit that to the job manager to run. Uh, and in the beginning, I said we've been using uh, RocksDB as a state backend that comes with Flink. Uh, and also, Flink gives us the ability to essentially like take a save point of our pipeline. And if we wanted to do something like a node rotation, where uh, mm -hmm. let's say we follow this model called as a blue green deployment model. So if you were to make a change to an existing production pipeline, uh, before you you bring it down, let's say let's call it the blue cluster where you have a running production pipeline. Uh, you wanted to bring, uh, you wanted to update some code and deploy a new version of it. So what we essentially do is we we trigger something called as a save point uh, in Flink, which creates a snapshot of the current state of the pipeline. 
Uh, we spin up a new green cluster, a uh, new cluster called as a green cluster, essentially the same cluster, but with different code and resume the from the save point. Uh, and then we do uh, we do the switch for, to, to bring down the blue cluster and then green becomes the active cluster. Uh, so this kind of fits naturally uh, with Flink as well. Uh, and uh, this th this is the model that we currently follow when we're deploying pipelines on Flink. Now we, we take that same Uber jar and we can then submit that to, to our own uh, legacy cluster using Spark. Uh, and we, we oftentimes run like bad jobs uh, on that cluster depending on, on our platform's requirement. Uh, now, some of the key things that we, we were able to accomplish with Beam, uh, as I've been saying, as I've been emphasizing a lot, is the ability to, to write your pipelines once and run it on, on multiple places, uh, being agnostic to a runner and also a vendor. Uh, makes makes your architecture really flexible, uh, and then we don't have to worry about maintaining like two different distributed systems. Like doing one itself is hard enough. Uh, forget two, so that's where Beam again naturally fits. Uh, is a good fit for us when we have like a single unified model. Uh, and then uh, the there, there there had been cases in our earlier journey when some of the IOs or the connectors were not present in Beam, uh, and that's where. Uh, we were able to contribute those back to the community uh, and then use that. So I, I think the, the contribution model and the activeness in the community is also something that uh, that is important when you're trying to uh, modify the code uh, and not having to like maintain your own code base is something that was also important. And we, we were very happy to work with the Beam community to, to essentially do this. Uh, so uh, I guess enough talking for now. And now I'm going to switch to my IntelliJ screen. Um, and show you guys uh, what might some of the uh, what does a pipeline uh, look like in uh, in our world? So uh, so I'm going to look at the my I'm I'm having it on my bigger monitor, so I'm going to look away from the camera for now for a while. Uh, so uh, let's say uh, I was talking about uh, some of the abstractions that we have built. So here's a very simple uh, GitHub project that I have. Uh, which kind of abstracts out all the core pieces that we have, but still gives you the uh, gives you some insight on what what does it mean to write a pipeline with us. Um, so we have this uh, high level uh, abstract class called as pipeline setup, uh, in which we provide like these two methods. You you get to implement like what is the building of the pipeline for you. Uh, you you uh, anybody who wants to write a new pipeline essentially extends from this class. Uh, in my in, in this specific example, let's say we wanted to consume from two different streams. Uh, customer and order, uh, and these are going to be coming from a Kinesis feed, essentially. So there's a customer Kinesis feed, there's an order Kinesis feed, uh, and we are, we are in, in my example, I'm going to deploy this on a direct runner. So in terms of what does an abstraction mean, uh, what does a platform ex abstraction mean um, uh, for, for, for our end user? If you were to consume uh, data from Kinesis, you, you would be using Kinesis IO. You specify what is the stream name. You specify where in the stream do you want to start consuming from. Uh, and then uh, input of the Kinesis is written in the form of bytes. But here we do want to convert those uh, bytes into a concrete Java class. In our case, the, the customer uh, that I was talking about earlier using this customer proto. So I want to convert that and I want to convert my input into this the Java object. now. Uh, the abstraction that we provide to our consumers is just saying uh, all you do is you 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 use this uh, interface called as the platform feed, uh, and you tell us what is the stream that you're trying to consume from, and we will give you uh, once you apply. I guess once you once you call this, uh, you get a P collection of platform customers. And what's hidden right now from customers is that it's reading from Kinesis, uh, and it, how, what does the conversion process look like for different data types uh, for uh, when consuming data from Kinesis and translating it back to this object. So with four, with four lines of code, you essentially have a P collection of uh, a, a well-defined data type. And I guess this is one of the simplest examples. We also consume data from uh, from Hive. Uh, and this also takes, we have abstractions that also take care of reading data from Hive. All you do is say something like, give me, uh, I want to read this table and here is what are the fields and it gives you a peak collection of that. So uh, at this point, let's say your goal was to read a couple of different data streams. Uh, with these eight lines of code, you you now have a peak collection of an orders feed and a customer's feed reading data from Kinesis. And also remember, we uh, it knows how to unify the data from Kinesis uh, and also from S3. Uh, so once you do that, uh, uh, in, in, sorry, let me let me reiterate the example that we'll be looking at. We are trying to uh, do an aggregation uh, of for a customer what is their total spend 
uh, with GoDaddy when we run this pipeline, essentially. Uh, so, so now uh, I, I take this customer, a fee collection of, of platform customers, uh, convert it into uh, using this customer transform, which is a pretty simple transform. All it's doing is taking this from this type and converting into a customer total spend aggregate type. Uh, and, and the goal here being to unify these two different fee collection types in into one so that we can then use a combiner to, to essentially key it by uh, the, the customer ID uh, and, and then run the combiner. Uh, so in this case, uh, this step is, uh, all it's doing is converting it into, converting the platform customers using the transform uh, into an aggregate, uh, into this uh, class called as a customer order aggregate. We do the same for, for customer orders. Uh, we extract the keys in this case, we are saying, I'm going to do um, a combined operation using the customer ID key. I define what my window is. Uh, in this case, uh, this is not what we use actually in production, but this is an, a simple example I could uh, I did for this presentation. And I'm saying my my delay is uh, the events arriving late are only like up to 30 seconds. Uh, and then here's another example of an abstraction we have provided, which is uh, called a streaming merge. And this is something our internal implementation. This what it's going to do now is. Uh, we can actually look at what uh, the implementation is. It's going to uh, essentially store uh, the the if, whenever you get a customer ID, it's going to take that as the key and store the object corresponding to that in a map. Now, when it gets another update to it, it's going to uh, update the the state of that protobuf object uh, and update the map, and then uh, you specify what does it mean for your data to be complete, uh, and by specifying a data completeness function. And this is the our way of knowing when do I emit something downstream. So, what does a completeness function here look like? I have a pretty naive. Uh, uh, completeness function at this point uh, in this example. Uh, all it's going to say is uh, when I, I see, uh, let me open my function, uh, when I see an amount field uh, in the message, uh, which means when I have data coming from my order stream, that's when I'm going to uh, essentially output something downstream. Uh, and then uh, I'm not doing any, I'm not doing any writes to any uh, destination, just printing the output uh, on the console. So. Uh, what does it really look like now? Uh, so I'm going to spin up uh, a local Kinesis uh, infrastructure here uh, using local stack. Uh, and now I'm going to run my, uh, oops. I added a readme to then uh, essentially uh, create a couple of Kinesis stream. Uh, so here uh, I'm going to create the orders or the customer Kinesis stream. Uh, using uh, uh, local stack and then uh, here's the orders Kinesis stream. Uh, so now uh, I'm now going to run the, the the streaming pipeline and we'll look at what does it really what did it mean to combine those two data sets together uh, as an example they should run in the next two to three hopefully 10 seconds uh, while we do that so here's uh, here's an example uh, if you guys remember from the beginning I said we will be doing uh, the uh, the ingress stack itself uh, is responsible for getting the data into the platform, in this case, uh, into Kinesis. Uh, and now here's an example of what a payload might look like. Here's a JSON blob about a customer that says, here's the first name, the customer ID, what countries they are from, and what is the timestamp when this was created. Uh, uh, this is, again, a simplified version of what that payload looks like. Uh, but if I were to create this customer, uh, I'm going to clear the screen real quick. Uh, uh, what did I do? Oh, sorry about that. I missed the partition key. Oh, and now I'm, I'll, I'll do this quickly and leave, I guess, at least four or five minutes, three minutes at the end for questions. So here I created all three together, which is creating a customer feed with one data entry and then creating uh, an orders feed uh, with two uh, entries into it. So if you look at it, uh, when, I, when the customer purchased a domain for the first time, uh, uh, it outputted uh, this value when they when they got when they purchased another domain. It increased the count of transactions to two and added the amounts uh, using this pipeline. This is kind of a, a skeleton project for anybody who wanted to like start uh, exploring Beam. Uh, I can send a link to this GitHub project. Uh, this essentially has those uh, abstractions. All right, uh, I am now going to. Switch back to my presentation, and I think we can open up for questions. All right, Ankit, thank you very much for the talk. 
It was a great talk. And we have some questions, I think. Let me look at, at the list here. Okay, um, so there's one question. What if a save point fails? How does the platform react to such failure without message or state loss? So uh, let's say if, if uh, remember we have two, we will have two different deployments. We, let's say we have an active deployment call as a blue deployment and we're trying to save point and that fails. Uh, we wouldn't really switch to the newer uh, version of the cluster. If the save point fails and let's say even if the entire cluster were to go down, since we have the data available in persistent storage in S3, we do have the ability to essentially just replay all the events. Worst case scenario, we have the ability to replay all events from S3, get the pipeline caught up, uh, and then uh, retry that operation. Uh, uh, that, that's I, I guess that's our way of mitigating entire cluster failure on our, on our end. And, and that does happen. Uh, when let's say your job manager goes down, if you were not running, if you were running it in a non high available environment in a non HE environment, clusters can go down. Uh, and that's where the ability to replay all of your events is something that's really important. You can scale up, you, you, can, you can deploy a lot of task managers uh, to really speed up the process if you're trying to backfill some of the data uh, and then bring it back, bring back down the number of task managers uh, again when you're only in streaming mode. So I guess this is the, our way of, uh, of handling those failures on the platform. Okay, so another question from Jason uh, from the Slack channel. He asked, uh, he says, thank you for your talk. And I saw you're using fixed windows with a loud lateness of 60 seconds. Will will the pipe and discard the late arrival data if the data is late for more than 60 seconds? And there's another, another addition to the question. In another scenario, if we want to read the historical data, which could be a few years or months ago, does the fixed window work in this case? So I guess the oh, so, questions. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, I think in my example, I just wanted to bring something up for a quick demo. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily, if you were trying to backfill uh, historical data or legacy data, which could be, uh, which could be a lot of data. We also have that in our case. You wouldn't really use a fixed window. You could use a global window uh, where you essentially say, I, I don't want, because events can uh, arrive later. Uh, you do have to define what does a good lateness policy look like for you because you can't wait for events to come like to to show up forever. So in our case, we we have using some uh, historical data about what is we have run these pipelines for a while now, so we know what would it mean for late data to arrive. Uh, and then if you were to backfill uh, entire history, we do that using uh, a global window. Uh, and then we are doing up search in the database. Uh, and if you remember, I said we specify a completeness function if you're trying to join a few streams together. Using using that completeness function is how the pipeline authors tell us when do you emit something downstream. Uh, and uh, since we are doing upsearch, uh, and each uh, each payload has uh, an attached version to it, so we know if it is the latest version, we use it, update the state. If we get a previous version, we just discard that message. All right, do we, I think maybe we have time for one more question. Another question is, so if you have a save point, um, what does the, like what format do you use to, to save these save points in? I guess, and connected to this question is, what if the new pipeline that you deploy is not compatible with the old one? And uh, what do you do in this case? Do you probably, you, you backfill like you just said, or, um, what do you do when you upgrade your pipeline? Yeah, I, again, great question. So uh, I, I think if the save point is incompatible, there is nothing you can really do. If you make breaking changes to your pipeline, you can't really do anything about it. That's where like the ability to replay events uh, comes in really handy. Now, sometimes let's say your source, it's your source table added some breaking fields. Uh, you have a table that you're consuming from, you added a breaking change to it. Even your ingress stack, ingress data that you wrote into Kinesis and to S3, it now becomes invalid. Uh, if you modify this, a break, if you introduce a breaking change to your schema, in that case, you do have to, again, stream from, let's say in our case, our legacy systems are in CDC. So we do have to stream those changes from CDC and also do a one-time backfill or get a one-time snapshot from the source table if there was such a breaking change. Uh, and I guess, what was the other question related to what format do we use those save points in? I think well, he asked when you... Like, yes, what's, what's the format? Is it in JSON or... Oh, it's in JSON. Yeah, okay, great. Um, or I guess my uh, to to clarify my our, our inputs are in in JSON format. Uh, uh, when we 
So I guess when you write to Kinesis, it gets converted into bytes, but the source itself is is JSON, and then data that gets written into S3 is also in JSON format. All right, makes sense. So I don't know. Do we have more time? Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe somebody reminds me. Oh, we are over time. Well, great oh, okay. talk, Ankit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great questions. All right, see you in the Thank next you. session. All right, thank bye you. Bye. bye.